Uh, hi, I'm Professor Paul Rouser from the Department of Asian Languages and Literatures at the University of Minnesota, and I'm here at the James Ford Bell Library on the university campus to talk a little bit about poetry in Dream of the Red Chamber, and most specifically the famous flower burial poem that Dayu writes in chapter 27. And I've included a discussion of the poem along with a character-by-character -character breakdown of the text uh, for you all so that you can sort of follow along uh, with my discussion here. Um, now, Chinese poetry had always been a major part of traditional Chinese narrative uh, from very early time. Quite often, characters exchange poems when they're friends or when they're lovers, and the poems are supposed to reflect a strong sense of the bonds between the two people and also to reflect their personality. Um, later novels often use poems to describe scenery, for example, or emotional situations. But I think Cao Xue Qin is particularly striking for the way that he uses poems to accentuate uh, the personalities of the poets and to represent their interactions. Now, anyone who reads the novel knows that there are dozens of poems all through the, you know, from, from the very beginning to the very end. A lot of those poems occur in a highly formalized situation where members of the garden come together to write poems about particular topics. There's uh, a cycle of poems in chapter 37 on uh, crab apple blossoms, and chapter 39 on chrysanthemums. Chapter 50, there's a linked verse competition on uh, snow, and on chapter 79, I believe, there's a linked verse on the autumn moon. Um, and those are all very important, I think, for representing the characters and their personalities, but it's probably the Dayu poems that she writes independent of these moments that reflect her personality most accurately. And it's pretty clear throughout all the novel that Dayu is the best poet pretty much in the novel. She usually wins the poetry competitions. About the only competition she has as best poet is with uh, Miao Yu, who is called Adamantina in the Hawks translation, the, the, the Buddhist nun poet. Um, but at the same point, these longer poems that Dai Yu compose, uh, compose tends to show um, her personality uh, in a much stronger light. And that personality is usually that of an, uh, an emotional esthete. Um, and this also is particularly interesting because it tends to reflect a lot of the aspects of Dayu that um, are considered to be not the best qualities to have if she's going to succeed in traditional Chinese society. They reflect someone who's very wrought up, who's very emotional, and as I'll talk a little bit about today in, in this poem, they also potentially place her in a position where she's no longer a proper woman uh, but a woman whose even her standard morality could possibly be put into question. Uh, now, talk a little bit about the form of the poem uh, in chapter 27, the flower burial poem. The poem is written in what is usually referred to as a ballad style. Uh, it usually has lines of seven syllables um, and with a stanza, usually a stanzaic division after every four lines with a rhyme scheme of A, A, B, A, C, C, D, C, and so forth. Um, also typical of the ballad style are occasional insertions of extra metrical lines. I'll point those out to it when we get to it. And also stanzas can last longer than four syllables or four lines. And even in one case, we have a stanza that's only two lines, which I think is probably poetically important. And what I'm going to do is um, have our Chinese reader read the poem in Chinese. And you can follow along on the handout if you want to sort of look at the meaning of each individual word of the poem. And then I'll do my own translation, read that for you. Uh, the translation in the David Hawkes um, translation of the novel is really quite exceptional. It's quite a tour de force. But in order to follow the exact rhyming uh, of the Chinese original, he's forced to often make changes from the meaning of the lines. So I'm trying to give you here a translation that's a little bit closer to the original. Okay, we start off with stanza one, which sets the scene. Uh, and it, basically starts in as we sort of move in on a, uh, a Chinese garden, presumably the Da Guan Yuan, or Prospect Garden, right, where Dai Yu is going to be burying the flowers. Hua xie hua fei hua man tian, hong xiao xiang duan you shui lian, you si ruan xi piao chun xie, 
落絮轻沾扑袖帘。This is your standard four-line stanza, and here's a translation: The blossoms fade, the blossoms fly, the blossoms fill the sky. Their crimson fades, their scent dies out, and who is there to pity? Drifting threads gently twist together and float past the springtime lodge. Falling willow floss lightly sticks and strikes the ladies' window drapes. Now, a few things about this poem. It already tends to suggest、uh, female content in the Chinese poetic tradition, with its emphasis on flowers and springtime, and also a slightly erotic tradition, since spring is usually thought to be the time of love, of renewal, and so forth. And it's very typical in the erotic verse tradition of China to portray women who are alone. Uh, without their lovers or their husbands, who are kind of mourning the coming of the spring, and also, as we'll see, there's a constant preoccupation with the idea that in spring, all things are renewed, but we do not renew. We keep getting older every year, and so there's also an element of the woman who、uh, no longer has her, or no, no longer, or does not yet have her mate. Whether she's unmarried or whether her husband is away or has abandoned her, this kind of sense of passing time、uh, in her loneliness, right? There's also a moment of voyeurism here, where we kind of have an outside vision approaching a bedroom window. And here in this particular stanza, we end with this、uh, line about the the lady's window drapes, which presumably is where Dai Yu is、uh, at this particular point.、Um, and so she's doing something rather interesting here because. A lot of Chinese erotic poems are written by men who are kind of projecting their erotic feelings onto a woman who they then observe as by themselves. There's a kind of a voyeuristic movement、uh, as they're sort of peeping in at the window. And here we have Dai Yu rather interestingly being both the voyeuristic eye of the poem and also herself. And later on, she herself speaks,、uh, so that we have this kind of narration voice on the one hand and Dai Yu's voice on the other. And we move on to the second, the second stanza. 闺中女儿惜春暮，愁绪满怀无事处。手把花锄出绣阁，忍踏落花来复去。And the translation: Within her chamber, the maiden pities how spring grows late. Brooding thoughts fill her breast, no way to bring relief. She takes the flower hoe in hand, leaves her luxurious chamber, and bears to tread on fallen flowers as she paces back and forth. Now, as in most heroines of these type of poems, she's very, very sensitive to the changes of spring and to the sadness of falling flowers, which presumably represents her own、uh, failing youth, right? As she continues year by year、uh, without a lover.、Uh, the A、uh, phrase here that I translate as "brooding thoughts."、Uh, actually, the word for thoughts here is "shu," which is also the word for threads. And this also plays upon a series of puns that are very typical in Chinese erotic poetry, where the idea of of a thread, which in Chinese is sometimes、uh, pronounced "su," is also a pun for thoughts or melancholy or love longing. And so, quite often, thoughts are portrayed as kind of like thread-like that you're kind of following along the thread, the chain of thinking, right? And they kind of are like tendrils that kind of reach out to the lover and so forth. And so, the the willow floss and so forth, and other plants that kind of give off kind of flossy kind of blossoms and so forth, are kind of the exterior manifestation of this particular、um, uh, this particular type of of、uh, of love longing, right?、Um, Okay, and now we move on to the third stanza, and at this point,、uh, the poem starts to become a bit more philosophical. 柳丝渔夹自芳菲，不管桃飘雨里飞。桃李明年能再发，明年闺中知有谁？ Willow floss and elm tree seeds are fragrant on their own. No need to fret that peach blossoms blow and pear blossoms fly away, for peach and pear the coming year are able to bloom again. But next year within her chamber, who will be there then? 
So once again, we have a reinforcement of this idea of natural cycles being renewable, but human beings are not. Right? They grow older with each year. And so there's no guarantee that the beauty, who is once again sort of Dayu being seen by an outside narrator here, is still going to be there in a year. She could have married, she could uh, die, she could simply become a different person with the experience of the year. Right? There's no permanence here, and right? everything that changes in one way or the other. And so in this case, there's a touch of irony introduced. Right? The narrator points out that the character Dayu mourns the death of the flowers when she is unaware or seemingly unaware that she herself is going to be changing and may possibly die. And next stanza. 三月香潮已累成,良间燕子太无情,明年花发虽可着,却不到人去良空,潮也清。in late spring, the fragrant nests are built up row on row, and in the rafters, the swallows are just too cruel to us. Next year, when the flowers bloom, the birds can eat them up. Yet, don't they know? People leave, and the rafters empty, and all the nests are upturned. Now we have a new element of nature introduced. We've had flowers before, uh, and Dayu's reaction to the flowers, and now we have birds. So birds and flowers are kind of the two chief elements that are often typical images in this type of poem. Uh, we have a number of birds in this poem, and the first ones that turn up are swallows, or yen. Now, swallows in poetry are most famous for building their nests in the rafters of houses. And so you have a sort of a young swallow couple coming in, building a nest with mud and branches and so forth, and raising a family in the rafters. And so they become a symbol of conjugal um, happiness. Right? So it is also a very typical Chinese image for the, um, the lonely single woman to see these swallows building their nests and sort of remarking that, that uh, she herself is still unattached. And so then the swallows become cruel. Right? They're building their nests here, and so they seem to be mocking the girl right, who notices their presence. And yet, nonetheless, the poem also suggests that the swallows, too, are going to leave their nests, um, and so they, too, are impermanent. So even though they become a symbol of happiness, right, they're also a symbol of the impermanence of happiness. Uh, here, too, we also see the introduction of a little extra metrical phrase in the fourth line of the stanza, right? Uh, yet not know, tre bu dao, right, which I translate as, as yet don't they know. This is very typical in this type of ballad style, where the ballad narrator turns to the audience and makes a particularly strong point, emotional point. So such extra metrical lines are often introduced at moments of, of a high emotion. Okay, next stanza. 一年三百六十日,风刀双剑沿相逼,明媚先言能几时? In one year, all of 360 days, knives of wind and swords of frost press all urgently. Such bright enchanting loveliness, how long can it last? One morning it will drift away, impossible to find. Okay. Now here, it's, here the blurring between a woman's beauty and the flowers is kind of accentuated. And it's unclear whether the stanza is talking about the fading of the beauty of women or that flowers, which may bloom all through the year, not just in spring, also fade away. I think David Hawkes interprets this as flowers. But the stanza remains ambiguous in this case. We really don't know whether this is mourning the death of the plants or mourning the aging of women. And that ambiguity is quite deliberate. In the next stanza, we have a movement from the philosophical sort of... Um, meditations upon aging uh, and their relationship to spring to uh, the, the poetic character of Dayu herself, right? Not the narrating voice of the poem, but the girl who comes out to bury the flowers. And so we have this stanza. 花开意见落难寻,街前闷沙葬花人,独以花厨泪暗洒, when blossoms open, they're easy to see. When they fall, so hard to find. 
So melancholy before the stairs, the flower burial girl. Alone she leans on her flower hoe as her tears secretly fall and fall upon the empty branch where traces of blood are seen. So here we have Dayu coming out in the garden to bury the flowers, and suddenly we have this highly emotional reaction. No longer do we have this kind of philosophical meditation on the flowers passing and the seasons passing, but Dayu's direct emotional response. Right? And rather, like many heroines in these poems who stay in their bedroom uh, lackadaisically mourning spring, she decides she's going to do something about it. So she actually comes out into the garden um, and sort of confronts the narrator's eye, right? the sort of voyeuristic eye that's been typical of the poem up to this point. She's now out in the open rather than inside. However, we have this incredibly powerful image, one of the most powerful images of the poem, where she presumably sheds tears of blood because her emotion is so great, and unwittingly these tears fall upon the branches uh, that are now bereft of flowers because the flowers have fallen and she's going to bury the flowers and her blood then becomes new blossoms on the flowers. And there's this moment of confusion when you don't know that whether it's blood or whether it's flowers. And this confusion uh, is, is it's a kind of an exaggeration and an intensification of a standard image in Chinese poetry. Uh, women do shed tears of blood in poetry. Uh, sometimes it's a poetic conceit that claims that when you cry and cry and cry until you don't have tears anymore. The only fluid left in your body is blood, so you start crying blood. Um, there's also a realistic aspect to it because women often applied, uh, applied rouge to their cheeks. So as the tears run down their cheeks, they take on the red color of the rouge and so appear to be blood. Um, but it's, it's a kind of a cliche, right? But here I think transforming it into the blossoms is a very powerful image. And when you also think in the, the, the context of the novel about Dayu's tuberculosis and the fact that, that um, emitting blood, coughing up blood, becomes a sort of a major aspect of her, of her own illness, um, this particular image, I think, is even more striking in this case. We then have, in the next stanza, another bird introduced, the Du Juan, the Cuckoo, or sometimes called the Nightingale. Du Juan Wu Yu Zheng Huang Hun, He Chu Gui Chu Yan Chong Men, Qing Deng Zhao Bi Ren Chu Shui, Leng Yu Qiao Chuang Bei Wei Wen. The cuckoos all fall silent now, just as twilight comes. She shoulders her hoe and turns to home, shutting the doors behind her. A dying lamp lights up the wall where she tries to go to sleep but a chilly rain knocks on the window and her blanket has yet to warm her. So here we have a continuation of a number of erotic images. Uh, Dayu now goes back into her room after having buried the flowers, but she's emotionally distraught from uh, what she's just encountered. Uh, the cuckoos, interestingly enough, fall silent at this point, even though they're supposed to be singing through the night. It's a little unclear what the connotation of that is. One interesting fact is that Dayu's beloved maid, Nightingale, translated as Nightingale in the Hawks translation, her name is Dujuan, this very same bird. So there may be some connection or an allusion here to Dayu's maid as well. Uh, but we have some of the typical images of women at nighttime here. They're, they have insomnia because they're restless, unhappy. They leave the lamp lit because they can't get to sleep, um, and they're sort of brooding on the various things that are upsetting them. And there's also the reference to the cold blanket, right, which um, in more erotic poems often represents the loneliness of the woman who doesn't have a companion to sleep with. Right? So once again, I think we see Dayu kind of flirting with erotic tropes here, which makes the poem in some ways not quite a proper poem. Um, she's maybe a little too interested in replicating that kind of erotic heroine in these poems. And we know in other places in the novel, right, that she's often to take into task by Bao Chai and others for reading you know, literature that's thought to be unsuitable for a woman because it has an erotic subtext in many cases. Okay. Um, now the next stanza, uh, now and for the rest of the poem, we actually have uh, Dayu speaking. And so this is, begins with this particular stanza, which is longer than the other stanzas. Uh, and that will be true of a number of the later stanzas as well. 怪奴底事被伤神,半为连春半脑春,连春呼至脑呼去,至又无言去不闻。
，昨宵庭外悲歌发，知是花魂与鸟魂。And so this is in Dai's voice. I find it strange. Why is it that I keep wounding my spirit thus? I seem to be half in love with spring, and half of it vexes me. When my love for it suddenly comes, then vexation at once departs. But when it comes, it comes silently, and when it leaves, no one hears. But last night, beyond the garden, a grieving song came forth. I know that it's the flower spirits and the bird spirits too. So here she is in, as an ins,、uh, insomniac thinking about this, and she uses language here too that I think is slightly erotic. Only she displaces the lover、uh, to spring. Right, spring is the unpredictable force that comes and goes, and she can't really know whether it's going to come or not. Right,、um, but she does hear one thing here, which introduces a touch of the supernatural. She hears the lamenting spirits of the flowers and the birds,、uh, who are about to die as spring departs. And who themselves, their spirits are about to depart to another world, and that、uh, other world is then referred to in the next stanza, which also continues a slight supernatural、um, quality to the poem. 花魂鸟魂总难留，鸟自无言，花自休。愿奴斜下生双翼，随花飞到天尽头。天尽头，何处有香秋？未若锦囊收燕骨，一剖净土掩风流。至本节来还节去，强于乌闹现渠沟。Now, as you may have noticed, this is the longest of the stanzas.、Uh, the rhyme continues through all of these lines, and also has these extra metrical lines in the middle to emphasize、um, the emotion. Right when she expresses the desire to follow the flowers. Uh, to another world,、right? flower spirits and bird spirits always hard to keep them there. The birds fall silent on their own, and flowers grow ashamed. I wish that below my arms I could grow a pair of wings, and following flowers fly away to the very edge of the sky, to the very edge of the sky, where somewhere there's a fragrant mound. Better it is in a brocade bag to gather their gorgeous bones. And with a handful of purest earth, bury their refined grace. In substance, they came from purity, and to purity shall return. Better far than in mud and miry trenches fall for good. So we have this stanza in which Dai Yu imagines her ability to grow wings and fly away to where the the spirits of the flowers and the birds have gone, and there to actually perform a more formal funeral, right? Going to the fragrant mound supposedly where they will be buried in another world, right? And she can't do that, so the only thing that she can do is bury the petals, right, and keep them from being、um, muddied and、uh, suffer impurity from the mud and the water and so forth.、Um, And she uses the rather striking term of "gorgeous bones," right, to describe the petals as if they're the bones of the flower.、Right. Interestingly enough, here I think there's also a kind of a reference to the larger supernatural frame.、Um, Dayu is not a a,、uh, a bird, but she is the incarnation of the so-called crimson pearl flower. And we can imagine that the place where the flowers and the birds are departing to is the very land of disenchantment, where she came from. Right, so that there's this. Kind of desire to return home to a kind of a supernatural home.、Okay. We now have the shortest stanza of the entire poem, which is only two lines, just one rhyming couplet, and so that probably suggests that we have a kind of emotional high point here. And in fact, I think that's the case. 而今死去农收葬，未卜农身何日丧。Now you are dead and gone. I gather you for the grave. And I'm not yet able to foretell where my own death will be mourned. And so here,、uh, the character Dai Yu comes to grips with something that's been suggested earlier in the poem from the narrator's voice: that the changes of the season and the falling of the flowers presage the death of humans as well, and that she herself, you know, recognizes the irony of burying the flowers when she herself is unaware of when she will die and who will bury her. Right. Okay. We then move to the last stanza, which reinforces these themes、uh, in a rather powerful way. 农金葬花人笑痴，他年葬农知是谁
，试看春蚕花渐落，便是红颜老死时。一朝春尽红颜老，花落人亡两不知。Now, as I bury the flowers, others laugh at my folly. But in that future year, who knows who will bury me? Just look as the springtime wanes and flowers gradually fall. Just the time when the rosy face of youth grows old and dies. One day, spring will run out, and old grows the rosy face of youth. Flowers fall, and people perish, and neither of them know. Now, here, Dai Yu. Uses a sort of flexible structure of ballad style to do a lot of repetition here, right? She repeats over and over again the same handful of nouns and images, right? Herself, people, outsiders, flowers, spring, the rosy face of youth, right, um, and so forth, right? And in order to do that, she brings together even more strongly the connection between herself and the flowers who are dying, right?、Um, Also important here, I think, is this mention of people, of outsiders, people who don't understand her.、Right? And so we have this reference, I think, here at the end to Dai Yu's emotional sensitivity, her role as a kind of artistic outsider. People aren't going to get her; they're not going to understand why she's decided to bury these flowers in these little brocade bags, right? And I think we see here, as is typical throughout the novel,、uh, in the portrayal of Dai Yu, that she's kind of caught up in a, a sort of a vicious circle. Right, she recognizes that people don't get her; that she has this kind of aesthetic and emotional sensitivity that others don't quite get, and it causes her to behave eccentrically. And as a result of that self-awareness, she becomes even more emotionally distraught and introverted in a lot of ways, and so then projects the very sort of emotions that cause the others to continue to feel this way about her: that she's kind of a problematic character, that she's touchy, that she's hard to get along with, and so forth. And once again, she becomes aware of this once more, and that sort of accentuates this kind of continuing problem with her.、And、I think that kind of illustrates, I think, in a very strong way, the way that Sal Shuichen uses poetry in the novel.、Um, as I said at the beginning, this idea that the novel, that the poems reflect not just the social life of the interactions of the characters, but also is supposed to be a kind of a clue to their personality. And so we have, in a very real way, through these poems, the idea that character is destiny. Right? That Uh, the, the characters, the poems themselves, become prophetic because they reflect the personality of the characters, and that what their their very personality then、uh, manifests itself in the novel and has some sort of role in what happens to them in the end. Dai Yu's flower burial song: the blossoms fade, the blossoms fly, the blossoms fill the sky. Their crimson fades, their scent dies out, and who is there to pity? Drifting threads gently twist together and float past the springtime lodge. Falling willow floss lightly sticks and strikes the lady's window drapes. Within her chamber, the maiden pities how spring grows late. Brooding thoughts fill her breast, no way to bring relief. She takes the flower hoe in hand, leaves her luxurious chamber, and bears to tread on fallen flowers as she paces back and forth. Willow floss and elm tree seeds are fragrant on their own. No need to fret that peach blossoms blow and pear blossoms fly away. For peach and pear, the coming year are able to bloom again. But next year, within her chamber, who will be there then? In late spring, the fragrant nests are built up row on row, and in the rafters, the swallows are just too cruel to us. Next year, when the flowers bloom, the birds can eat them up. Yet, don't they know? People leave, and the rafter is empty, and all the nests are upturned. In one year, all of three hundred sixty days, knives of wind and swords of frost press all urgently. Such bright, enchanting loveliness! How long can it last? One morning it will drift away, impossible to find. When blossoms open, they're easy to see. When they fall, so hard to find. So melancholy before the stairs, the flower burial girl, alone she leans on her flower hoe as her tears secretly fall, and fall upon the empty branch where traces of blood are seen. The cuckoos all fall silent now, just as twilight comes. She shoulders her hoe and turns to home, shutting the doors behind her. A dying lamp lights up the wall where she tries to go to sleep, 
but a chilly rain knocks on the window, and her blanket has yet to warm her. I find it strange. Why is it that I keep wounding my spirit thus? I seem to be half in love with spring, and half of it vexes me. When my love for it suddenly comes, then vexation at once departs. But when it comes, it comes silently, and when it leaves, no one hears. But last night, beyond the garden, a grieving song came forth. I know that it's the flower spirits, and the bird spirits, too. Flower spirits and bird spirits, always hard to keep them here. The birds fall silent on their own, and flowers grow ashamed. I wish that below my arms I could grow a pair of wings, and following flowers fly away to the very edge of the sky, to the very edge of the sky where somewhere there's a fragrant mound. Better it is in a brocade bag to gather their gorgeous bones, and with a handful of purest earth bury their refined grace. In substance, they came from purity, and to purity shall return, better far than in mud and miry trenches fall for good. Now you are dead and gone, I gather you for the grave, and I am not yet able to foretell or my own death will be mourned. Now as I bury the flowers, others laugh at my folly. But in that future year, who knows who will bury me? Just look as the springtime wanes and flowers gradually fall just the time when the rosy face of youth grows old and dies. One day spring will run out, and old grows the rosy face of youth. Flowers fall, and people perish, and neither of them know.